Americans, at 11 o'clock on the 11th of November, 1918, the most destructive war in history to that point in time ended with a ceasefire. The human losses were staggering. Millions of young men from Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and North America lost their lives in a war that no one in 1914 expected to last more than a few months, if that. The senior military officers of all the nation's armed forces, though severely tested by the lethality and destructive power of new weapons, hardened their hearts and numbed themselves to the human carnage. Some adopted an excessively professional, almost scientific approach, calculating the numbers of lives that would have to be invested in an advance of only a few hundred yards. Americans sustained 318,000 casualties, including 110,000 dead in only 110 days of fighting in France. Comparatively few by European standards, but the loss of American life in such a short period of time made a lasting impression on the American psyche. Yet America did emerge from the war as a great power. American society became a true melting pot of cultures and peoples with the beginnings of a modern armament industry, a fleet, and a burgeoning air force. A short time after the war, the Democratic Party that had led the United States into what Americans concluded was a needless slaughter of World War I was thrown out of office. Americans voted the Republican Party into power, a condition that would last until the onset of the Depression in 1932. In the meantime, the military professionals in every country vowed that they would learn the war's lessons. But surprisingly, little was learned. People clung to obsolete organizations, tactics, and thinking. In less than a generation, elected leaders in the democracies became enthralled by the means of destruction, particularly air power, and made no attempt to restore reason to armed struggle. When World War II broke out first in Asia and later in Europe, the Western powers sank resources and manpower into the bottomless pit of war at breakneck speed, just as they had in 1914, 15, 16, 17, and 18. The devastation of the Second World War was at least three times greater than it had been during the First World War. But there were lessons that could have prevented or at least moderated the Second World War. One leader after World War I penned his views. Sir Winston Churchill described the conduct of the First World War in the following terms. Events passed very largely outside the scope of conscious choice. Governments and individuals conformed to the rhythm of the tragedy and swayed and staggered forward in helpless violence, slaughtering and squandering and ever increasing scales until injuries were wrought to the structure of human society, which a century will not efface and which may conceivably prove fatal to our present civilization. Like the Americans who fought in World War I, and for that matter, the Europeans who fought in the First World War, Americans today seem blissfully unaware of the dangers of war. For most Americans, war is something that happens thousands of miles away on someone else's soil. But this time, it's different. If nothing is done to end the conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East, there is a real potential for the destruction Americans see only on television to reach our shores. Without carefully defined goals and interests, conflicts in both regions could race out of control and escalate. Washington's determination to preserve the illusion of American global hegemony ignores the fact that our economy is not capable of carrying the burden of a major war in Eastern Europe, Asia, or the Middle East. We are not reinvesting enough in new production capital, replacing outworn and outmoded technology. Our people do not enjoy a stable or preferably rising standard of living, which is measured in terms of both per capita consumption and life expectancy. 
Prices are not stable, and unemployment is growing, not shrinking. Our public and private educational institutions, once the envy of the world, wallow in mediocrity to accommodate political correctness and diversity. Our military power now rests on the legacy of the Cold War. It is overstretched, undermanned, badly led, and the wrong fit for the 21st century. At the same time, it is not difficult to know what Americans want. They want an America of homes, schools, and hospitals, illuminated with hope and happiness, where mothers freed from the necessity of working to make ends meet can stay home to love and train their children to be good citizens. Americans want their children to be safe from abuse and exploitation, to live under wholesome conditions. Americans deserve to thrive inside a safe society where our laws are enforced, to eat healthy food, and to receive an education that provides a path to employment. As we pause on Veterans Day to glance back over the long, destructive trail from World War I to today, Americans should remember the veterans of previous wars who believed they must conquer or die to protect American freedom and prosperity. We must never forget that while every citizen contributes his or her labor and talent to American society, it is still the soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine who puts his or her life at risk and often yields it up in our country's cause. Americans, more today than ever before, we must make sure our cause is just and not an illusion as it was in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, and ultimately in Iraq. Americans, we must make sure our fighting forces are not compelled to fight far from our shores when there may be no need to fight at all. We must ensure that when our forces fight, they fight for American national interests, that our forces are truly ready for the fight, and our economy and society are healthy and strong in support of the fight as they were in 1991. Thank you for listening. God bless you and the United States.